Yes, please. There we go. So hopefully you guys can all see um, the heading. This is, in case you guys don't know, this is Brewing 102, Little Yeasty Beasties. Um, this is going to be hopefully a fun class. If not, I'll just drink more and I'll try to make it fun. Real quick before we get into the housekeeping, which I always like to cover, um, I see I have some repeat people that have taken my classes before. So hi, um, that's going to be helpful. If you don't know who I am, my name is Marina Entworth. I am the head of the Midwell Brewers Guild. Um, I also have a chalice for historical brewing and there's a few other things in there that really doesn't matter. What does matter is I've been brewing for, I don't wanna know, old enough that I think it can now drink. No, I think it's a little bit less than that. I think they can drive now. However, um, I do wanna tell you what I am and what I am not. I am a brewer, I am not a scientist. Um, I am a brewing educator. I know enough about the basics of yeast types cultivation to make happy, healthy brews uh, with healthy being the key point there. I know slightly more than the average medieval professional brewer would have known. Now, with all that being said, if you would like to get more into the scientific side of things, we have both home brewers, we have, we have a couple of home brewers in the Middle Kingdom with science degrees. In fact, one of them is actually a Laurel and she also teaches chemistry for a living. The other one, make sure that your milk that you drink is, is safe to consume. So I trust them when they say that there's chemistry with yeast involved. We will not be covering cultivating your own yeast. That's something completely different. If rum continued to go in this format, I would be talked into teaching that if you really want, but I think there are some people that might be a little bit better on that one. This is going to be good for beginners and intermediate brewers. Um, it'll be a good refresher for the advanced brewers out there. I know I see some of the people on this. I know I have a couple of advanced brewers. Um, grab a beer. Hopefully we're going to have fun. Um, if you've never taken one of my classes before, if you do not have a sense of humor, this might not be the class for you. Um, we laugh, we drink, we do the chicken dance, sometimes with real chickens. Also, when it comes to yeast, everyone is really highly opinionated, myself included. I am gonna go ahead, I'm gonna give you guys my opinions when it comes to some of these yeasts and stuff like that a little bit later. So, um, with the housekeeping, you are going to want to have a drink with you as long as you're over 21. I need to say that because you can use yeast as a non uh, 21 year old, but we do recommend having a drink. Um, I have two, the one I started with, and I have one on tap because um, it just makes everything a little bit more enjoyable. Maybe a pen or a paper so you could take down notes. If not, um, type them out on your, uh, computer and I will try to get these notes over as well as some links to some things that'll help you guys out. If you have questions, because there is a lot of information that I'm going to try to cover in the next 45 minutes. And if I try to cover too much, I talk really fast. And so I try to slow down. Um, please utilize the chat for all of your questions. Um, we have our most amazing rum host, Elizabeth, today. Woo! And so she will poke me, prod me if I need to answer something right away. Otherwise, um, I can do it at the end. Also, we do have the Drunken Duck website. You can message me privately through there. Um, I will try to answer that in a semi-timely fashion. Um, I also want to go ahead and give everyone an apology. You will hear chirping in the background. Um, I have baby chicks in the fireplace. I have Madonna, my Polish chicken sitting next to me. So she might quack a little bit. And I've got Serenity, my wonderful bar dog in the other room. However, I luckily have a teenager on rent to me this week. So she's trying to keep the dog quiet. We'll see how that works. So if there's other noises, just go with it. Drink, have fun. So with all that being said, we're going to go ahead and we're going to jump into this. Like I said at the beginning, this is for beginners. This is the basic thing that every brewer should need to know in order to brew and working with yeast. Actually, before I get into this, I'm going to tell you why I teach this class. Um, the main reason is I have a lot of people who I'm very thankful for come up and say, here, try this. 
or what do you think about this? Or what can I do to change this? I also love, love, love judging ANS um, when it comes to drinks. And nine out of 10 times, whatever issue they were having actually comes down to an issue with their yeast. And a lot of times I'll go ahead and I'll ask them, I said, well, what yeast did they use? And, and they'll say, I don't know. Or they'll ask me, what yeast should I use? And I was like, I don't know. What do you want to brew? What's the temperature in your basement like? Like, give me some more information. So I think there's a lot in yeast choice that a lot of people actually don't give it credit for. A lot of times people will get their kits and they'll throw them together and they'll start brewing. And then a couple of kits down the line, they'll start doing, uh, making up their own a little bit, which is fabulous. And they'll just keep on using the same yeast that came in their kits. And that is not what we want. We want you to have fun and choose the right yeast for you. There has to be a joke in there about being poly yeast or something. I'll figure it out eventually. Um, so to jump into it, what is yeast? To be as simple as possible. Yeast is actually a fungus. It is not a bacteria. A bacteria is a whole different class, which we would cover when we do goses and sours. So it is a fungus. I think it is the only fungus I actually enjoy consuming. It is the best fungus among us. Basically how it works, and this is how I explain it when I teach my Brewing for Kids class, is yeast eats the sugars or glucose that is in your recipe, and it pees out alcohol and it burps out CO2. So that is as basic as you're going to get on how alcohol is made. Now, when that happens, there are other things, esters, um, some chemicals, some other flavors, and we will be getting into that hopefully in an easy to consume basis here in a second. So yeast eats the sugar, the glucose, it pees out the alcohol, all of that. Ha -ha. When, now to get a little bit more scientific, I promise this is the most scientific I will be the entire time. When the yeast first hits the wort, and for those that are beginner brewers, wort can either be, in this term, it could be the, the wort that you put for beer, or it could be your honey mixture, or it can even be your wine, your juice mixture if you're making wine, or even your apple juice if you're making cider. When that yeast first hits that wort, or whatever that is going to have, the concentration of glucose are very high. So through diffusion, glucose enters the yeast. In fact, it keeps entering the yeast as long as there's glucose in the solution. And we'll cover that in a little bit more of a knowledgeable basis a little bit long, uh, farther down as well. As each glucose molecule enters the yeast, it is broken down in a 10-step process called glycosis. The product of glycosis is two to three carbon sugars called fibrates and some ADPs, which supply energy to the yeast and allow it to multiply. The two fibrates are then converted by the yeast in a carbon dioxide, CO2, and ethanol, which is the alcohol in beer. That's it. That's as most scientific as we're going to get. But I had to get through that. Yeast also produce a number of vitamin, of vital nutrients during the fermentation, including some essential minerals and B vitamins, just to name a few. This is how you get having Guinness for breakfast. It was actually a very healthy thing. Um, and to this day, uh, when I was a kid, don't judge my family for this. When I was a kid, if I had stomach aches or if I had const I was constipated, my dad would give me a beer because the yeast will do the same thing in your body that it kind of does when we're making beer and stuff like that. Weird thing, my plumber has me throw my yeast down my sink because I'm on a septic system. So somewhere in my septic system, there is beer being brewed in a weird kind of weird thing. Now, I promise this will not be a scientific. This will be a little bit more easy to understand. So there are three main points of fermentation and I promise all of this will mean a whole lot more a little bit later. So first you're gonna pitch the yeast and this is where the yeast absorbs the oxygen and other various minerals that exist within the actual glucose sugar. Yeast then begins splitting because they're happy, they're reproducing, they're getting all of the sugar. And so they're just reproducing like crazy, increasing the cell count for whatever conditions they are in. That will matter a little bit later. 
this is the phase where most of the flavor compounds are created. And this phase can last anywhere from six hours to two days. Um, just as some cool things, I'm gonna throw out some vocab words that may or may not mean something to you later on. Um, one of them is a uh, delay time frame, And this is um, the lag time that it takes for your yeast to produce within your wort or your recipe in order to get enough yeasties going to turn all of that wonderful stuff into alcohol. Next comes my favorite part. And I think most people's favorite part, which is the active fermentation. Now, um, this is where the yeast actively digests the sugar, creating the alcohol and the bubbles, the carbon dioxide. This is the critical stage where the temperature plays a really big role. Um, you wanna keep your temperature always within the, the range of the yeast. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later because that is also really important. Um, if you do not, your beer will develop off flavors. If it gets too hot, if it gets above 75 and your yeast is only rated for 68, the likelihood of you getting weird, bad flavors in your beer is high. Now, if something happens and it gets a little bit too cold, which has happened with all of us before, um, you're not as likely to get bad flavors as you are to just have the fermentation either slow down or stop completely. Um, by the way, um, this stage is really awesome to see. You'll get a crassen, cool vocab word. That's the foamy head that develops on top of your fermenting beer. That'll form. The airlock should bubble constantly. Um, and this stage will normally last somewhere around five to 10 days, depending on which yeast you use and the sugar content of your original wort. Um, as I go down on my notes. Finally is conditioning. And this is one that sometimes people, aka myself, have a tendency to shorten and it's not always a good thing. So in the conditioning phase, yeast will drastically slow down and chew through the final sugars. Uh, the crassin, that's that cute little head on top, will begin to fall and sink back into the beer and a layer of trub another cool vocab word, that's the sediment, will develop on the bottom. Your yeast uh, will clean up any of the, har the harsher byproducts produced during the first two phases. This is what's going to make your beer drinkable. This stage is important as it will help beer taste cleaner with less off flavors and generally help the beer taste better. A lot of times when people say that they feel like the beer has a homebrew taste, it's because they did not condition enough. Now, the stage um, typically will last anywhere for four to seven days, though um, I have a tendency to keep my beers and ciders, meads are a different story, in that primary fermentation with all of this stuff for about two to three weeks before moving it onto the second um, second fermenter or bottling or kegging. That's just to make sure we get a really nice conditioning in there. So when yeast is added to your wort, its food source, it immediately goes to work fermenting and it's going to take those sugars into alcohol turn, with turning, taking the sugars into alcohol and CO2 and other flavors. These are the things that we kind of have a tendency to skip over in the beginning of the homebrew. Um, we don't go over the esters. We don't go over the phenols. And these are the things that have a tendency to taste off or taste good. I'm going to take um, uh, Hefeweizen as an example. Hefe Hefeweizen, oh, say that three times fast, has very, it's yeast strain that it uses has very particular esters that will give it a banana flavor. You want that banana flavor in your Hefeweizen. You do not want that a banana flavor in your porter. So you want to make sure you choose a yeast that goes ahead and is going to give you those banana esters. Um, sometimes uh, the phenols are the things that have a tendency to taste a little plasticky or medicinal or sometimes woody or spicy. And these are things that you kind of want in your beers, as long as you're choosing the right yeast for your beer. 
Um, and then there's also a few other ones that get into the nitty gritty. And I already promised you, I'm not going to give you too much science because I'm not a scientist, but there's some other chemicals and other flavors like that, that might taste astringent or might have a medicinal flavor with the yeast. And nine out of 10 times, um, the yeast, when you look into it, when you look into a particular yeast strain, it'll tell you what those phenols and those esters are going to be. Um, scroll down. I have two computers, so it's really cool. So where the wild yeast lives, there's going to be two kind of yeasts I want to talk about on this one. <clears throat> There are tons of other yeasts, especially when you get into some of the wines, the ciders, and the meats. But for beer, there are ale yeasts and there are lager yeasts. And I don't know why my little outline didn't go well on that one, but ale yeasts are top fermenting yeast. This means that the yeast goes to work uh, fermenting your beer at the top of your fermentation tank. So you're going to see it near the surface of the wort. That particular yeast is always going to be Saccharomyces cervicius, and I'm going to pronounce those wrong, and that's totally okay. Your other one's going to be lager yeast, which is your bottom fermenting yeast. And this yeast um, ferments at the bottom of your tank away from the surface. And that is at the surface. And that's actually a whole different brand of yeast. And the reason I wanted to just throw this out to you guys before we get into some of the other details is ale yeasts are a lot more forgiving than lager yeasts. Um, and the reason why is lager yeasts have a very particular temperature, a particular way they like to be brewed. So if you're not careful with those lager yeasts, they can go a little funky. You're going to get weird esters with those if you don't have the right temperature. Um, if you're worried about temperatures at all, stick with your ale yeasts or your cider or your mead, uh, mead yeast. Those are going to make your life a whole lot easier. So you have now all of this science and yet you go, I don't know what to do with this. Well, before we get into that, we got to talk about how you're going to get your yeast. So there's three kinds of ways that you're going to get your yeast in order for you then to put it in your recipe. And this is where I said this is the very beginning, but there might be some of these things in here that some of our intermediate people don't know. So first of all, there is dried yeast and I have some dried yeast here with me. Um, and this is where I'm going to give you guys opinions. I have opinions. Um, it has a very long shelf life. Um, each one does actually have an expiration date somewhere on it. Um, don't ask what this expiration date is. I bought it for SCA 50. Um, so I should probably brew with this shortly. There are ways to get around the expiration date, by the way, but that is a different conversation or later on. Um, it has a very long shelf life compared to all of the other ways that we're gonna introduce yeast. It can be pitched directly into the wort. And when I mean pitch, I mean throw. And when I mean throw, I mean, you're gonna open this package up and you can put it right into your, um, into your wort. It's as easy as you can get. However, you can rehydrate the yeast per the instructions and then pitch it. That's what I do. That is what I recommend all of my students do. And that's kind of what, um, if there's a problem, I always ask them, well, did you rehydrate your yeast first? And, and they say no, and then I get on them for it. And then we figure out what's going on. It is cheaper. Um, it, it, I would like to say, depending on the brand, it's cheaper. No, the dried yeast is hands down cheaper. Now, you're telling, you're saying, okay, well, you have a yeast that I can keep in my refrigerator for quite a few years and it's cheaper. Why don't I use this? Not all of the yeasts can actually survive the drying process that they use in order to create the dried yeast. So therefore there's not as wide of a selection as there is of um, the liquid yeasts. Now I don't have a liquid yeast on me because I don't use them. Um, if I have a very specific one that I want to use, I will pick one up, <clears throat> but that's the whole reason I don't have one to shake in front of you. With the liquid ones, they normally come into a in a tube um, and it looks just like a tube of yeast, I guess. Um, it can be one of the pros is your pitching rates can be customized more easily by creating a starter wart in, in order to increase 
the cell count of your yeast. Remember at the beginning, I said the very first thing that happens is we add this to either our starter or to our recipe or something like that. And all those yeasts are gonna reproduce. They're gonna go crazy. Um, you have a little bit more control over that in both the measurement form and how much starter you use with the liquid than you do with the dry. With the dry, you're basically gonna throw this whole thing in. It doesn't matter if you're gonna do one gallon or five gallons. So you have a little bit more control with the liquid. <clears throat> It does require you to make a starter. And we'll talk about that here in a second, but you have no choice. You do not take that liquid in that cute little test tube and you do not pour it straight into um, your wart because this is what's gonna happen nine out of 10 times. I know I have people that are in the comments that say, well, I do that all the time, it turns out fine. That's fine. Nine out of 10 times it might happen, but one out of 10 times what is going to happen is that your yeast are not going to produce quick enough in order to make your brew safe. And another fungus or a bacteria or something horrible that might be as strong or stronger than your yeast is gonna get hold of your brew and it's gonna ruin it. Don't take the chance. Starters are your friend. Um, on the plus side, there are hundreds, thousands, quadruple thousands of strains available in the liquid form, which is kind of cool. Now, unfortunately, it also must be kept refri refrigerated and it does have a shorter self shelf life. You cannot keep them in your refrigerator for for four years. It's just, you can't do it. You're gonna end up throwing them away. Now, technically a smack pack is considered um, a liquid, but it's slightly different. And so I do wanna, I, I consider it its own little creature. Basically a smack pack is a liquid version that is inside a little um, envelope. And what you do is you open it up when you smack it, it releases the contents into nutrients. So it basically has the starter, it has the yeast inside a packet with a, a starter. So it'll get that going and that you can go ahead and put straight into your wart. So you're like, okay, I'm leaning towards one of these. I might not be leaning towards one of these. How do I actually put these into um, your wart? And this is how. So. I covered it a little bit already. With the dry yeast, you can literally just open it up and put it in there. However, I recommend rehydrating it. And I recommend, like I said, to all my students, rehydrate it. Um, these guys, because they are five years past their expiration date, um, I think they all are five years past their expiration date, six years, I will rehydrate these because what that is going to show me is it's going to show me if this is in fact alive or dead before I try putting it into my wart because there's nothing worse than putting a dead yeast into your wart. So what you're going to do is you're going to take a bunch of either sterile water or your wart, which is what I like to do, or even if I'm doing a mead, just some sterile water with um, a little bit of the honey in, and you're gonna put this in there, normally around 80 so degrees. If it is too hot for your finger to go in the water, I know, no, it's no longer sterile, but temperature wise, if it's too hot for your finger to go into the water, it is too hot for the yeast to go in. You're gonna let that rest, um, maybe agitate it a little, you know, get it moving and let it sit for about 15, 30, 45 minutes. And what you're going to do is you're going to see a foam on top. This is the same technique that you use to rehydrate your yeast when you're baking bread. If you do not see a foam on top, let it sit a little bit. Make sure it is nice and warm. Maybe add a little bit more sugar. If it is still not getting foamy after a couple of hours, you have dead yeast and you got to run to the brew store and get another one. Or like me, go to the refrigerator and hope one of the ones are not dead. Now, if you have one of those cool little liquid um, liquid tubes, you're kind of going to do the same thing. You're going to remove it from the refrigerator. You're going to let it sit for about two to four hours. If it if it is winter time, it's going to be closer to four hours. If it is here in Ohio and I have no AC going, it's going to be closer to two because that's going to warm up a little bit more. Um, you're going to go ahead and mix that with a little bit of your DME, which is your dry malt extract with a little bit of water. Um, after that gets all nice and warm. And once again, you get it cool down to about 80 degrees and then you put your yeast in you. This is going to take longer. You do this the night before. Um, so it does take a little bit more planning. Um, 
within one to three days. And I've never had one go longer than 12 hours, but that's personal. Um, that's why I do it the night before. It's going to get that nice, cute little foamy top on the top that we got with the dry yeast. Then you go ahead and you start your brew day, you get everything going. And once you get your wort to the right temperature that it wants you to for throwing your yeast in, you throw that in. Um, smack, the smack packs are really easy. Um, you're gonna take it from the refrigerator, refrigerator. You're gonna let it come to room temperature. It's kind of like those nice little hand warmers that when you smack them, um, they start heating up chemically. This is the same thing. There's a little thing in the corner where you're gonna break it and you're gonna shake it. And that is gonna go ahead and it's gonna get all the nutrients mixed in with the yeast. And it's, you're gonna let it sit for three to five hours. Um, and then you can go ahead and you can throw that right into your work. Now you're all saying, why don't we just all use smack packs? These sound fabulous. These sound amazing. I hate smack packs. And the reason why I do is no matter how many I get, every other one of them is dead. Um, either something happens in the shipping process. They, they just, and it's not that the yeast are dead. Well, sometimes the yeast are dead. Sometimes that little thing in the in the corner will go ahead and it'll break prematurely. It puffs up prematurely. Your yeast eats all of those things. It had nothing else to eat. It ends up killing itself or it gets too hot or it gets too cold. I've had one freeze and break that way. Um, I find them temperamental, um, but that's my personal um, choice. Try each one, see what you like, see what works for you. Um, but with that being said, this is where I said I was going to give you my opinions. I hate smack pack and I love dry yeast. So for your healthy fermentation, and this is where I was talking about where things might potentially go wrong. By the way, if you haven't taken a drink recently, drink because I know I need to. There are four things when it comes to your yeast um, to make sure you have your healthy fermentation. One is choosing the right yeast. You are not going to choose a champagne yeast in order to make a stout. Um, it's the wrong yeast. It's going to be the wrong temperature. It's not going to like the nutrients that you give it in your stout wort. And please, someone out there, don't challenge me to do it because I have friends that are now going to go, I'm going to make a stout with a champagne yeast. Please don't. <clears throat> you also, when you go ahead and you put that yeast in your wort, you want to make sure you're aerating it adequately. You want to make sure it has enough oxygen in your wort so it will help get that fermentation going. Um, by having this adequate oxygen levels in the wort, it makes sure that the yeast grows and reproduces during that, that fermentation. We want it to be happy. We want it to reproduce like crazy. Um, when you get stressed yeast flavors, that's an actual term that is directly related to the stress yeast has to do when oxygen is not available in the very beginning. So if you don't have enough air and that, and people have different ways that they like to aerate. Some people like to have two sanitized, um, containers, pour their warp back and forth. Some people like to stir. Some people have automatic stirs, things like that. You just want to make sure you get oxygen in there when you put your yeast in. The next one is making sure you have enough yeast to go ahead and ferment whatever amount that you're going to do. Now, luckily, uh, a lot of the people that sell us these yeasts are not stupid. They know for a majority of the people, they're going to be brewing in five gallon batches. Um, so they go ahead and they produce for the most part, all of the yeast in order to do five gallon batches. Now, with that being said, um, if you're going to have, if, if you're gravity of your five gallon batch is above 1.060, you're going to need two of those packets. If your gravity is above 1.090, you're going to need three packets because you just, you have more of those sugars. You need more of those yeasts. You don't want your sugar to suffocate your yeast. Um, you also and I talked about this earlier and I said we were going to come back to it. You want to make sure you have the right temperature. You want to keep your, your temperature consistent. Depending on what you're brewing, they really highly recommend putting it in some place that is dark, like a closet, um, because direct sunlight can actually, when it goes through the glass carboys, it can kill your yeast or it can make them really warm and overly happy and do weird things like that. But putting it in a nice, dark place 
that has a consistent temperature where the temperature is not going to go up. It's not right next to your, your heater vents. It's not right next to your dryer. It's not, like I said, right in front of a, sun, a window where during the day it's going to be warm, but at night it's going to be cold. You want to make sure you have very consistent temperatures and the right temperature for your yeast. And we will talk about that a little bit more. We're about halfway through the class, which is great because I'm about halfway through the slides. I'll talk quicker. I'm not going to go over all of these. First of all, mostly because I believe you guys can read on your own, but these are some of the vocab that I have been using. Um, when I'll send over the PowerPoint over to our amazing ROM staff, so that way they could go ahead and put these up. But this talks about some of the vocab that if you have a, a, a problem and you come to me, which I love it when people come to me with problems, I really do. Um, if you have a problem and you come to me, these are gonna be the things that I'm gonna ask you. I'm gonna ask you, what was your fermenta fermentation temperature? What was your pitching rate? How much pitching rate is basically how much of the yeast did you add to your beer? Um, uh, so these are the things, and these are just some of the vocab that you're gonna want. Now, I want you guys all to go down to number nine because that is my favorite. Oh, yours aren't numbered like mine is. The second to the last one, alcohol tolerance. This is very, very important. This is the ability of the yeast to withstand alcohol. So real quick, before we go over into some more of the nitty gritty, um, when your yeast eats your glucose and your sugars and it's, it's creating alcohol to at some point, and it depends on the yeast type, at some point, there's going to be so much alcohol to the rest of the ingredients that it, that alcohol will kill your yeast. Um, a good example is like when we wipe down things because we want to clean our counters, we wipe down with alcohol. Alcohol will kill things. So it just, it makes logical sense that if your alcohol, con your alcohol to your sugars get to a certain amount, which is your ABV, your yeast will die. This is also one of the reasons, and I know someone's going to come up there and they're going to say, well, yeah, they make a yeast that you can get 32% alcohol. Yes, they do. It's chemical. It's really modern. Don't use it, please, because I don't want to drink it. Um, for the most part, yeasts don't get above 20%. Our home brews don't uh, because that alcohol content will kill those yeasts for the most part. There are always exceptions to the rule, uh, especially when it comes to brewing, there is exceptions to the rules. So like I said, at some point, these as a beginner to an intermediate brewer, if you can learn this yeast terminology, you're going to be better off than about half of the advanced brewers out there. So you want to find out, you're like, okay, Brina, you have now been talking 35 minutes straight, which I find is impressive on yeast. I want to know what do I use? Well, there's a couple of places that I'm going to send you because like I said, there are hundreds of yeasts out there and there are hundreds of different things that we brew. There's no way that I'm going to cover all of them. I am going to cover a few of them here, but I'm going to throw, look, I have a yeast. If you read your packet and if you have one of the, the South brews, um, always read the English side and not the French because I don't speak French, but it will tell you um, what temperature range it does the best on. It really does. It won't necessarily always, and it really depends on, oh, I had more yeast here. Those are all suppers. I had Nottingham somewhere on my desk. There we go. I got Nottingham. Um, Nottingham tells you what temperature to store it at, what temperature to rehydrate it at, but it doesn't tell you what temperature it really loves to be brewed at. So at that point, you're gonna wanna go to some of these websites. These are the websites for the majority of, and, and it's the majority, not all of them, of the, the yeasts that we have a tendency to use here in the Middle Kingdom or doing historical brewing or anything like that. There's a few other ones. Um, I am gonna make a comment about Red Star. I love Red Star. Some people don't. Um, I don't love Red Star Champagne for mead. And we'll talk about that here in a second too. Um, they, Red Star, weirdly enough, when you go to their website, it only really talks about their, their bread yeast. So I don't include that here. 
but um, those are some links that will hopefully be um, a little helpful to you guys. So when you're picking the right yeasts, some of the things I want you guys to keep in the back of the, the back of your mind is what is affordable? Um, and that might matter to you. It might not. You might not have a problem dropping $25 on a thing of yeast, or you might be me and go, ah, I have to buy a hundred of these yeasts to give out um, as gifts to new brewers. I'm just going to go for the cheapest one possible, which is going to be your Nottingham yeast. Um, it's one of the cheapest um, and it's dry, so it'll stay. Um, what is available? You cannot go unless you live near um, a jungle gyms, but you cannot go to your local grocery store and pick up yeast. Now you can pick up bread yeast and you technically can brew with bread yeast, but bread yeast was made for bread. And so when you use bread yeast in, in home brews, there is always that chance that you're gonna get a bread-like flavor. Now, if you are doing a beer, depending on the style, that might not necessarily be bad. Um, if you have nothing else, that's a possibility. Luckily, the internet is our friend and places like Midwestern Brewer um, and Amazon, I actually get a lot of my yeast off of Amazon, are really great for picking up yeast. Also, I have to say, please support your local homebrew store if at all possible. Go in, talk to them, find out what yeasts they like. My homebrew store is absolutely phenomenal. They're one of the best ones I've ever had. And when I made the comment that they didn't stock my favorite brand, brands, of yeast or types of yeast, they started stocking them just for me. That was helpful because I kept on sending people in to buy the yeast. Um, what works for you? Everyone, right, has a brew journal. We're just everyone shaking their head. Yes, yes, Farina, we all have our brew journals. Write down in there, um, in your brew journal, what yeast you use with your recipes and you'll learn which ones start working for you. You're gonna hear me say this a lot. Nottingham is my best friend. It is my favorite yeast. Anyone who has done any of my um, in-person classes or have gotten any of my kits or any of my students will all say, if you go, hey, what's Farina's favorite yeast? Well, Nottingham. Why? Because it's really hard for newcomers to mess up. It is also reliable. It is also cheap. But what works for me may or may not work for you. Once I get newcomers brewing with something like Nottingham, they might go and say, well, I want to try something different. And they might find the world's best cider yeast that works for them. Um, ask other brewers what they use, but do realize that you're going to ask five different brewers what yeast they use, and you're going to get 10 different suggestions. So take all of that with a grain of yeast, not a grain of salt. See, told you you had to have some humor. Okay. Um, and, and kind of go from there. Yes, there's chances that you might lose a couple of batches, but in the end result, 15, 20, 25 years down the line, you're gonna be a much better brewer by, by playing with the different types of yeast. And um, I remember right prior to uh, Middle Kingdom 50th, I did an experiment where I took uh, 10 jars of honey and 10 jars of cider and I took, uh, nine different yeasts. And I tried them in each, both the cider and the honey to see which ones I liked. And then I used the last one as controlled. And I accidentally, one of them grew a mold. One of them caught a wild yeast, which was kind of cool and fabulous. But through there, I learned which ones worked for my palate and which ones worked for not only my brewing style, but what the temperature in my house. So that was a really cool experiment. It cost me like $25 in yeast total. It wasn't bad, but of course that was quite a few years ago. So yeast has gone up a little bit. Um, the other thing to keep in account is your growing conditions. If you need something today, um, there's a good chance you're gonna choose a yeast that brews a little quicker. Um, some of them are a little slower. They take a little bit longer time to go ahead and get brewing. Um, some of them will actually be really fast. Now you're like, well, let's always just use the really fast ones. The problem with the ones that brew really fast, they have a tendency, those are the ones that you're gonna wanna bottle and leave in your basement for a couple of years to mellow out. Um, those are more of your champagne yeasts and stuff like that. Um, and your temperatures. 
if I, I live in a 1915 farmhouse, I have um, AC units in a couple of my rooms. I do not have them in my kitchen. I do not have them in my dining room and I do not have them in my basement. That's where I brew. Um, and so I'm not going to do a lager yeast here in Midwest Ohio um, in the summer. I'm not. Now in the winter, I can definitely get, I could do it as long as I don't keep it in my basement because I think my basement would get too cold for it. So know the temperatures in your house um, or where you're going to be brewing because that's going to help you pick some of the right yeasts. So you're like, Finally, 45 minutes into the workshop, she's going to give me some recommendations. These are just some of the recommendations. Um, and, and the reason I wanted to start with the cider ones first is because it's a little bit of the easiest ones. Um, if you want a cider with a very dry, neutral yeast, fa uh, yeast flavor, White Labs 715 is fabulous. Um, if you really want to go ahead and have a traditional English strong fermenting cider, go for the, the SAF ciders, or once again, the White Lab 775. So these are just some of the cider ones that you want. Now, I don't think I have it on this one. I am a geek and I like spreadsheets. So every time I use a yeast, what I'll do is I go ahead and I put it into a spreadsheet. Um, and I go ahead and I'll put down where it's from, what it's called, what it was made for. Can I use it for mead, cider, wine, or beer? I put ale and lager together on that one. And I'll go ahead and I'll put the temperatures down, which ones work really great for, you know, what, what their temperature range is and their alcohol tolerance. So now this is where I'm gonna go back to my age old, wonderful Nottingham yeast. I always recommend uh, new brewers to start with uh, Nottingham yeast for their cider. Why? Because it has one of the lowest alcohol tolerances out there, which means for both your mead and your cider, you're not going to get a really, really dry cider. It's going to die in your um, cider or your mead before all of those wonderful flavors go away. Um, if you, and I might actually have one here, if you use one of the red stars, especially the red star blue, um, what will end up happening is it's going to go ahead and it's going to eat every single last sugar in there prior to the alcohol content going really high. And so you're gonna end up something with 18% alcohol that has no residual sugars. So this is why your alcohol content is important. It, and mostly when it comes to things like your ciders and your meads, if you brew a cider and a mead and it comes out really, really dry, you can either go ahead and try back sweetening it, try next time you make that cider or mead add, have a larger um, sugar to water component, or you can pick a different yeast that has a lower alcohol content, meaning that it will kill itself before it consumes all of those sugars. Now, this is where I was talking about where I'm, the, I'm, I'm a dork when it comes to my spreadsheets. This is some of the meads that I have, or some of the yeast I've used in the past for some of my meads. Um, I like using the sweet mead yeast. I like using the Cote de Blancs as long as I have, that's the Red Star Green label, by the way, as long as I have enough time to let it mellow, mellow out. So this is what I recommend to people, and I will share my spreadsheets with anyone who wants it. Um, just send a message over to the junk and duck Facebook page and say, Hey, I want your spreadsheets. And I'll go, okay, can totally do that. Um, I also, I'll put the descriptions in from the yeast websites. So I don't have to go back and look at it every time. If I go ahead and I start putting my recipes together and I go, okay, I'm going to, I I've got to do some mead here shortly. I'm going to go and I'm going to see, first of all, what do I have? I think I have only ale yeasts with me. Um, I'm going to see what I have to see if I don't have to buy any more yeast. Um, oh, I can make cider. I'm excited about that one. Um, and then if not, I'm going to go to my list and I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to buy one of these. Now, beer. 
not even going to try to give you guys a list. Instead, I'm going to send you guys all to this amazing website. And if you have not visited this website yet, you need to visit this website. It is amazing. This is what this website looks like. So you guys don't all have to go rushing over there right now. Um, what it is, is you basically go through and you pick the kind of beer you want to do. Um, here, it's this is the one that comes up in the very beginning. It's the, an amber ale. Um, I Anyone who says, well, I need a beer recommendation yeast, if it's not one of the ones that I'm really great with, like I can do off the top of my head, like Hefeweizen. I really like Hefeweizen, so I don't know why. Um, stouts, um, Ghosts, and Sours, those ones I'm really, really great at knowing which yeasts I like to use. Um, if not, not, I'll send them to this website. And, and if they're not comfortable understanding the information, which every single one of you guys should now that we've gone over all of this, um, I'll, I'll walk people through it. However, they have every yeast humanly possible on that one. Um, so it makes your guys's life and my life, everyone's life a little bit more, uh, uh, just overall better. Wow. I can't believe I got through a lot of that information in 47 minutes, which means I can try to attempt some questions here in a second. But before we do that, there are a couple of places that um, when it comes to books or um, websites to go to, the first one is Fermentus. And I, I granted, I really love their yeasts. Um, you're probably like, I don't know what that is. That's, there's the camera. It's any of the saft brews, a lot of us will use those a lot. They're also the ones that do the safe cider. Um, they're fabulous, but their educational material, especially in particular, this PDF is really phenomenal. And it basically takes you through the whole thing that I talked about today in a little bit more scientific um, ways and, and far better than I can ever do. Um, with that being said, every single one of those yeast websites that um, I listed earlier, White Labs, if you go to them, um, if you go to their educational departments, like they, every single one of them will have tabs or something on that that will say, learn more about yeast. And they're really cool. Um, once again, the BYO.com for their yeast is hands down the best calculator I've ever found for ales and beers and lagers and that type. The only thing I don't like about it is it won't let me copy and paste the whole thing and put it into my spreadsheet. Trust me, I've tried numerous times. Um, when it comes to beer, the number one book on yeast I would recommend is uh, Yeast, The Practical Guide to Beer Fermentation. That's the first one on the list. Um, it's really fabulous. I'm also going to recommend my second favorite is the Brew Chem 101. I failed chemistry horrifically. I failed chemistry so bad they had to put me into oceanography. Um, I did really well in oceanography. I am not a chemist. I never will be. Um, we have those in kingdom, use them. If you are like me and you are not a chemist, but you do want to go ahead and try to take your brewing to the next level. And you're not sure how, um, some of these beer chemistry books are really phenomenal. Um, I, I highly recommend them. Um, sometimes I got a little stuck and I had to ask for help and I had no problem asking for help because like I said, I am not chemistry is not my thing. So real quick, you guys have probably all been looking at my wonderful backgrounds on my PowerPoint. And before we go to questions, I do need to bring it up. These are in fact, what beer looks like under a microscope. Um, I figured the past couple of videos, I did really cool brewing manuscripts. And since we were talking more about the science of brewing, um, we needed to have some really cool backgrounds. Um, they look fabulous. So support artists who do these. I know I want to get a, go ahead and get a few of them. So with that being said, do we have any questions? What is rum? Oh, good. Someone already answered that. Um, that is correct. Pasteurized beer does not have active cultures. Um, when it comes to pasteurized beer, um, which is something that we have a tendency not necessarily to do um, as home brewers. I have pasteurized uh, mead before because I, 
chose the wrong yeast. I'm going to admit that right up the bat. I made a mistake. I used a champagne yeast. It was in a pumpkin mead. And due to the amount of enzymes in the pumpkin and in the amount of honey, um, I was topping out at like 22, 23%. And I kept on adding more honey to it. And it just kept on just not being good. Um, and so I finally had a bottle it and pasteurize it. Um, we do have people who specialize that in kingdom. Um, Greg uh, Griff based out of Columbus, Indiana is fabulous um, with that. And if you guys ever have to pasteurize um, a homebrew, I recommend you contacting him. Um, and once you do pasteurize it, it, it does actually kill those active cultures, which is kind of cool. Um, is the initial fermentation an aerobic? Oh, oh, see, remember how I started and I said, I'm not a scientist. I'll get back to you on that one. But I like the next question. How do you do a second fermentation? Woohoo! Thank you, whoever answered. By the way, I'm gonna sound really smart. So we're gonna just delete that whole second process. Is the initial fermentation an aerobic or anaerobic process? It is an aerobic process. So thank you for adding that. Someone who obviously passed their chemistry and not didn't have to get put into oceanography. By the way, there's nothing wrong with oceanography and it was a fabulous teacher. Um, how do you do a second fermentation? Fabulous question. I also want to talk real quick for our beginning brewers out there, whoever joins us on YouTube, about what happens if you have a stalled fermentation because it has happened and most likely will at some point over your brewing career. Um, normally, when you do a second fermentation, you have you're, you're basically adding in additional nutrients, sometimes an additional yeasts. Um, you're going to move it from your 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 primary um, carboy or whatever you're brewing in, if you're doing a brew bucket and you're going to go ahead and you're going to add it over into the second one and you're going to add additional nutrients. Now that can either be done naturally, um, or it can be done chemically. Now, as I am a historical home brewer, I always like to do that a lot more naturally. So that might be adding additional honey or something like that. Anything that will go ahead and I'll start spark those yeasts to eat more and just keep going. Now, if you have too high of an alcohol content um, and your yeast has died, you might have to actually go ahead and throw in a second yeast. And they make yeasts specifically for restarting that or for secondary fermentations and stuff like that. Um, there's some cast conditioning yeasts and a few others. If I can actually look, I have spreadsheets that are really great for that as I'm opening up my spreadsheets right now. Um, and, and a lot of the yeast will actually say really great for secondary fermentation, really great for, um, well, here's a great one. Why yeast 4946, it's called, uh, the bold red or high yeast that main, it has a really high alcohol content. It has an 18%. Um, and it is made specifically for restarting stuck fermentation. So stuck fermentation is something happened and it was either not warm enough, or there might not have been the right mixture in your wort, or you didn't aerate enough and your yeasts just, they're struggling. They're struggling to eat everything at that, that wonderful wort buffet and they cannot do it and they cannot do it. And they'll either die out or it'll be so slow going that you're gonna get another, something bad is going to end up in there. And at, at some point you go, okay, it's been now sitting in here for four days and nothing has gone in my airlock. If you had done a starter or if you had rehydrated your yeast, you know, your yeast was good. So you know that your yeast wasn't dead. You just might need to go ahead and either add more of that same yeast or if it's later on in the brewing process, add a, a, a yeast that has a higher alcohol content. What tips for balancing starting gravity and yeast selection for given end sweetness profiles? Oh, um, yes and no to answer your question. Is that only learned by doing? Yes and no. Yes, you are going to learn a lot by doing it yourself. But um, it, it real quick, Lucy of Dragon's Lair, are you talking about um, cider or mead or beer? Um, because that's going to 
give me a little bit that I can help you out a little bit more on that one. Um, when you have, okay, first of all, I love that you brought up gravity because that is something needs insiders. Woohoo. That is something we have even experienced home brewers. I will hit them over the head with a hydrometer because they will not take their initial gravity readings. Take your initial gravity readings. One of the cool things I'm looking around and I don't see one around me. Um, one of those things that it will tell you when you look at your hydrometer is it will tell you the range that you want your sweetness. Now, um, if I'm having, if I'm doing a mead, I will go ahead and I will add in more of that honey. If I'm doing um, an apple cider, I might add in more concentrate. And that's just to make sure I get that initial gravity to where it needs to be. Um, and then after that, it's going to be more on your yeast selection. You're going to want to try, you're going to go back to some of those ones that are recommended for a sweeter yeast. Um, for the cider, <laughs> I know you're, everyone's going to laugh. Not surprising. Try Nottingham yeast. It's really good. It gives a nice mellow 7.5% cider with a lot of extra sweetness left over. Um, you're gonna, you might like that taste. You might say, no, I want to go ahead and I want to try one that you can go ahead and let her go. I have a, a, an attack puppy coming over. Um, she's getting hungry. She's getting hungry. Okay. Um, so a part of it is going to be trial and error. Now, if you want the sweeter, the sweeter items, stay away from anything that has an alcohol content higher than 14%. Or even for some of the people, I say higher than uh, like 11 or 12%, especially when it comes to the ciders and the meats, because what it's going to do is all those yeasties are just going to eat up all your sugars and there's not going to be any sugars left for you. Um, how how are terms dry, semi-dry, semi-sweet, and sweet interpreted? Ooh, that's a fabulous question. We actually covered that in one of the previous classes. Um, sweet, oh, um, when it, by the way, when it comes to my spreadsheet, dry does not mean on terms of this. It means, does it come in liquid form or dry form? Um, a lot of that, you're going to want to go ahead and I can send you some recommendations for a couple of good books that are going to break, give you the breakdown of the sugar, residual sugar content that is left after the yeast is done. And depending on where that residual sugar content is left, um, that is going to be what's going to determine if it is a sweet, a semi-dry, a semi-sweet. And I'm trying for the life of me to remember which one of the, of the classes it was covered. In. I think it was the second one, whichever one I did second. Um, how much care do you recommend when fermenting with different yeast to keep the colonies separated? Um, okay. So I'm going to go ahead and this is something, this part of this is going to go down to your sanitation. You have got to sanitize. Sanitize, sanitize, sanitize. This is the way that Oswin, a midwound brewer, is able to brew cider as well as vinegar is because he is one of the most careful people when it comes to san sanitation. Um, I have literally, I'm going to tell a real quick story because I like stories. So I'm brewing for mid -realm 50, not mid -realm, Society 50, and we went through an insane amount of homebrew. I personally, and I have photos somewhere, had five gallon buckets lining my entire kitchen. Um, and each one had a different type. The only ones that were separated were my loggers. And the only reason that they were separated was because I had to keep them in some place that I could keep them a little bit cooler. Because once again, I was in Mishawaka, Indiana in the middle of summer and I had no AC. So um, I have no problem keeping any of my yeasts um, I, I put them right next to each other. I brew next to each other, but I also sanitize very carefully. Now, with that being said, um, I do have, the only time where this is different is anytime I do sours and I know sours doesn't have anything to do with your initial yeast. Um, it's a bacterial infection that happens 
in the secondary afterwards, but anything that ever touches a sour has its own thing. It's labeled down to my kegs, my spoons, everything that is sour is always kept different because I don't want to get that bacterial infection into the rest of my items. Um, that's the only time I'm really, really careful with any of that. Now, like I said, with that being said, I have to keep my bread in my refrigerator because yeast is a mold or no yeast is a fungus. And due to the high amount of yeast that I have in my air at all times, the likelihood of you bringing a wart in here, if you do not add a good yeast or a good starter right away, if I went ahead and I just um, let it be open container, it would get a wild yeast because I brew that much and I have that much wild, I have that much yeast in the air. Now I'm weird and we all know I'm weird. So, um, most of the time that's not going to happen to most people. And a majority of those wild yeasts that are going to be in the air, they're not going to be as strong as these lab created ones, these lab created ones were made in order to beat out other ones. So if you accidentally get one or two little drops of, let's say I get one or two little drops of this guy when I'm brewing this guy, cause I'm doing them on the same day, this guy, as long as I use this entire packet, two drops of this is not going to beat out that. There are a few yeasts where that is not the case. Oh, would you get the cheese away from the dog? Sorry, brew dog. Um, so do I worry about that? No. Now, if you are going to do vinegar, sourdough, cheese, um, prosciutto, vinegar, any of that stuff, you will, you will want to talk to people who have experience both brewing and um, doing those to ask what they use for their sanitation methods. But I do brew and I do have a mother sitting in a vinegar jar in my kitchen. Woo! What do you use for sterilization of glassware? Oh, fabulous question. Um, there, that was the other topic I was considered doing instead of uh, yeast is uh, steril sterilization and cleaning. So I actually, I'm a hot water and bleach girl for 99% of my stuff. Um, I do also have OxyClean, which is an amazing thing that a lot of home brewers have actually started using um, as well as there are other chemicals. But when I am doing the majority, unless something is really bad, I am a hot, hot water girl and bleach. Um, there are different people that like to do use different things, but that's what I personally use for all of my glassware. My plastics and my woods are slightly different only because um, I want to, I, well, wood, I don't like bleaching wood, but um, you do want to go ahead and make sure you sterilize it really well. How much excess sugar do you want to start with to end up with a dry or a semi-dry mead? Ooh, that's a hard question. Um, it really depends on which yeast you're going to use. So that's going to be one of those instances where I'm going to recommend you play. If you really want to end with a semi-dry mead, um, first of all, try other homebrewers meads, ask them to taste them. I've got a whole slew. You're more than welcome to, to help yourself with. Um, try quite a few of them, see what flavor profiles you like and ask them what you say they like. Um, when you start doing that, then you're going to start going ahead and you're going to, you're going to play with your sugar to water content to get that right amount of sugars to whatever you like to your particular, um, your particular profile. And then you add in whatever yeast you like to get that flavor. If that hopefully helps. Um, if you would like Lucy, um, I can send you afterwards, send me a message once again, junk and duck on Facebook. Um, and I can send you a cool little mead handout that, um, I got from some Calenteer brewers. Um, for those that don't know, yes, I'm in the middle kingdom, but I started out as a Calenteer brewer. Um, and I love them. So, I think that is it for all of the questions. If anyone else has any additional questions, uh, feel free, go ahead and message me. I'm here to help. Like I said, I think this is the end of our rum classes, I think. 
Um, so if not, um, we'll come up with something else to teach next time. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to hand this back to Elizabeth. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Thank you for learning about yeasty beasties. Um, and I'll be hopefully trying all of your guys' homebrew soon. Yes, even uh, you, Lucy, who are out in Antier, believe it or not, I have friends out there. So I will come. I will stalk you. I will try your mead. We will talk. All right. That's it for me. Elizabeth, all you. Uh, we did have one other comment that accidentally came to me via direct message. Okay. Um, I believe it was when you were talking about you could use bread yeast, but it's not generally what you use. Um, there was a recommendation for Joe's Ancient Orange as a bread yeast mead that came from Lucy as well. Lucy, we need to talk because I don't know anything about that and I want to know about it. I see I have no problem admitting when I don't know things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we will talk definitely friend me on Facebook, Verena Ettenworth, or like I said, just go over to the drunken ducks Facebook page. It's hard to miss. We're the only thing that looks like a medieval tavern on Facebook with the name drunken duck. If you accidentally get the drunken duck farm, you can also message me, but you might have to talk to me while I'm holding a chicken. So yeah, that's it.